So in the first week of the series, I suggested to you that in order to fully understand and appreciate the Christmas story, you had to know the Christmas backstory. You had to be aware of all the events that transpired leading up to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, which is actually where we we're going to be in the next couple weeks of the series and where we have been. And we decided that at Christmas time we wanted to pick one Gospel to go through. We could go through Matthew or Luke or back and forth between the two, but we wanted to pick one because Luke will be very consistent in how he writes. His approach will be consistent, and he'll use a lot of the same um, tactics and employ many of the same methods in order to tell the story. So we had to understand, I suggested to you, it was important to fully understand, comprehend, and appreciate the Christmas story. We had to know the background of the story, the story that led up the backstory to the opening of the Gospel of Luke. So we talked about the story of the Old Testament, Israel's story. And so by means of a quick review, we talked about how God had made several covenants and promises with his people, starting with Adam and Eve, and then to Abraham, and then to King David. And then we talked about how Israel perpetually turned away from God in rebellion, so they had to go into exile. However, in their exile, and in their darkest moment, their lowest moments, this group arose known as the prophets. And the prophets began to foretell the coming of a new king who would make things right again in Israel and eventually the world, and that this, this king would be from the line of David, and would be from the line of Abraham, and would be from the line of Adam and Eve, the seed of the woman Eve, and we talked about that the first week, and we said that the phrase they came up with to describe this king was Mashiach, which means anointed one, and that's usually a term employed for a king in the Hebrew tradition, because whenever you would coronate a king, you would anoint their head with oil, so they were waiting for this Messiah to come and inaugurate God's right rule and reign upon the earth. But they also developed this other expectation for someone else that would come before the Messiah. And they called him the forerunner. And they said that he would come before the Messiah and would prepare the way for the Lord and make the people ready. So this was the expectation. Then Israel leaves exile, gets back into the land, and they rebuild the city, rebuild the wall. But it's just not the same. And they don't have the same kind of interaction with God, and they have to eventually just fight empire after empire that tries to oppose and oppress them. And it took us all the way up to the end of the Old Testament, and we talked about in the first week of the series how that space between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament is called the intertestamental period. And some people refer to it as the 400 years of silence. Now, we qualified that that silence was not God just being like, okay, um, see ya, bye, and leaving. It was more so that God was just more reserved. He was still provident over his people, but he was less intimately involved and less actively involved with the people, and there was no ongoing revelation at this time. That's why they call it the 400 years of silence. What we talked about during this 400 years, <laughs> this military superpower came to rule and reign the earth. And its name was Rome, this brutal empire that conquered the known world. We're going to talk about that more today. And they came into the land of Israel and oppressed the people. And that's the situation at the beginning of Luke. So then we talked about how God breaks through, in the opening chapters of Luke, Luke chapter 1, God breaks through the silence and he appears to two different parties, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And God sends his messenger to say, you're going to have a baby, his name is John, and he's going to actually be the forerunner that the, that the people were expecting and hoping for. And then God sends his messenger to this girl named Mary in this land of Nazareth, and, he's, and this messenger of the Lord says, you are going to give birth to a son, and he is going to be the son of God. And we saw through many allusions and references to the Old Testament that this child born to Mary was actually going to be the long-awaited Messiah, the Mashiach. And so God broke through the silence, and he started this process. He enacted redemptive history in order to fulfill the covenants and the promises made throughout the Old Testament. So we tracked... Israel's story. Here's what I'm going to suggest to you this week. Just as important as the backstory when we're talking about the Christmas story is the background of the story. The background of the story, the context and the culture of the day dictates everything about the story. You have to know the culture, the context, and the background of the day to fully understand and appreciate the Christmas story. Think about it this way. Perhaps years from now, historians will look back and they'll find like old uh, records from our time and they'll find all these Facebook posts 
And if they start reading these Facebook posts arbitrarily, divorced from the context of their culture, they probably won't make a lot of sense. They'll think, well, who are they talking about? What are they talking What? They probably won't get much of the language or many of the allusions or references because they, they don't know where it's from. People have a hard time reading the Bible because we don't know the culture and the context. So we hear these things and we're like, I don't know what that means. So today, what I endeavor to do with pretty much the whole sermon is give you the background of the Christmas story. What was happening in the world at the time of the birth narratives in the early chapters of Luke. One word. Here's what you need to know about the background and the context of the day. You guys ready for it? Ready, 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 ready? Rome. That's all you need to know. It was Rome. The Roman Empire dominated every aspect of life, and it permeated every facet of people's existence. It dictated reality for everyone. They ruled the world, and they ruled everybody's lives. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about Rome. When we read about Roman history books, a lot of times we are presented with these caricatures. We see these guys in like gold breastplates, and they've got helmets with a, with a red mohawk on it, if you're familiar, and they've got like the little mini skirt of, that looks like it's made of belts, and, or like ties, and then they've got the long, tall sandals that only women wear now. So like we see that, we're like, huh, that guy looks ridiculous. Not really scary. Or we'll see pictures of the Caesars, and they're wearing like a toga, and like leaves in their hair. Not really intimidating, and you'd think the empire, emperor of the whole world could afford to buy clothes that aren't just bed sheets. So we see these people, and we're like, oh, okay, that was Rome, whatever. And we see them in movies, cartoons, history books, etc. What we don't realize is what, why they seem kind of ridiculous to us today. They were terrifying in the days of the early chapters of Luke. Rome was feared, unlike any other kingdom, any other empire in the whole world. Rome was a fierce and mighty military machine that destroyed you if you stood in their way. In fact, the Roman army did war better than anybody else in the whole world did war at that time. And they employed two specific tactics. They would use what was known as the shock and awe approach. They would always, always, always attack their enemies when they least expected it and where they least expected it. They didn't play by any kind of rules. It was Roman rules. And they would attack you when and where you least expected it. And then once they attacked you, they employed another method, slash and burn, where literary soldiers would go in with their shields up, spears out, and just slinging their swords, and they cut down whoever stood in their way. They did not discriminate between man, woman, child, slave, free. They didn't care. If you were in their way, you got slashed, and then they would burn your city just to send a message. And in fact, what they would do a lot of times is if someone, in response to this oppression and this attack, tried to lead a revolt, they'd say, okay, and they would confiscate that person, and they would nail them to a cross and put them on a hill to send a message to the rest of the people and put them on notice. You don't mess with Rome. Rome was to be feared. This famous historian named Polybius writes about Rome, and he says, it seems like everything they do is just for the sake of terror. They terrorized the world so that they would, the world would fall in line. And Rome believed that the path to peace in the world was through domination and conquest and institution of the Roman way. And they believed that victory, ultimate victory, came through violence. Now let me tell you a little bit about Rome's interaction with the land of Israel and the land surrounding it. Which in the, in the time um, of the Roman Empire would be known as the province of Judea. And mm, the land surrounding it. In order to do this, I need to tell you about a couple of generals. First general I'm going to tell you about... Pompey, we got a picture of him. Throw out the picture of Pompey. Not the best looking gentleman. When I first saw this, I was like, this dude looks eerily familiar. Then I realized where I, I think I've seen him before. If I was casting a movie, I'd make this character John C. Riley. Look at that. The resemblance is uncanny. So, if anyone here is endeavoring to make a movie about Rome, that's an easy cast. That's a layup, okay? Anyway, Pompey was a monster. Pompey marched into Jerusalem. Struggled a little bit to take the city, but not that much. But then he got to the temple in Jerusalem, and he could not take it. And the Jewish people actually had fortified themselves inside of the temple, and they were trying to keep Pompey out. So Pompey learned about the culture and the religion, and he realized they took a Sabbath day. So on that day, he's like, 
we're going to move in closer because they're not going to fight on this day. So he moved his troops in closer and his ramparts in closer. And then he punctured a hole in the wall of the temple, punctured a hole in one of the towers of the temple. And this historian Josephus writes about this. And his troops poured into the temple. And during this whole conquest, Pompey killed, check it, 12,000 people. 12,000 people. That's Rome. Another general I'll tell you about, real gentleman, his name was Cassius. And Cassius, this story tells us, heard of a potential revolt in this place called Magdala, which is in modern-day Syria. And he hears about this potential revolt, and he says, oh, no, you don't. And he marches into Magdala, and he destroys their army, and he enslaves, because this is what the Romans did, 30,000 people enslaved. Because in Rome, if you weren't killed, you're probably enslaved. And if you got by, if you got out of both of those, you were lucky. Enslaved 30,000 people in Magdala. In fact, there's this character throughout the rest of the New Testament named Mary Magdalene. Anyone show of hands? Who's heard of Mary Magdalene? One of the main characters of the New Testament. Yeah, Magdalene. She was from Magdala. So perhaps she was aware of this situation in her lifetime. She knew the legend. She knew the story. She knew the history of Rome and just what they did to people who tried to rise up against them. Let me tell you about another Roman general, Titus. Now, some people confuse this with a, a Caesar later on in, in Rome's history named Titus. This is a different one. This is a general. This general was so fierce and ferocious that history attests to the fact that he crucified up to 500 people a day. He crucified up to 500 people a day. They said in the land at the time that they didn't have enough crosses for the bodies that Titus was killing. That's how brutal Titus was. And that was Rome. You do not stand in their way and you do not rise up against them. Last guy I'll tell you about. It's a general named Verus. And he learned about this uprising and this revolt and insurrection in this place called Sepphoris. Now, if you remember, I said Mary, Jesus' mom, was from Nazareth. Sepphoris was right next to Nazareth. This is the neighboring town. Verus hears that there's a potential insurrection, revolt, and uprising here. And so he goes into the city, destroys all the troops, and burns the city down. Burns it to the ground. Later it would be rebuilt by King Herod, but we'll get to him later. Brutal. That's how Rome rolled, and that's how they ruled. And some scholars and historians say that Jesus probably would have even been familiar with this during his time. That's how Rome worked. So, Rome ruled the world through violence and through domination. So let's ask the question, who ruled Rome? Which is hard to say, 10 times fast, I dare you. Who ruled Rome? Rome was ruled by a group of men known as the Caesars. The very first one, we have a picture of him, let's throw it up, Julius Caesar. Apparently does not have eyeballs. And uh, blindly in the blind, anyway. And also had a terrible bowl cut haircut. Mm. Um, you're going to see, we're gonna, I'm going to show you some of the Caesars. It's like a really sad fashion show. It's, it's uh, rough looking guys, but they were powerful. Julius Caesar is the first ruler of Rome who takes complete control and power. Rome had been ruled as a republic by the Senate, and Julius Caesar comes in and goes, bah, 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 bah. we're not doing that anymore, I'm in charge. And at first, he co-reigns with two other generals. One of them being Pompey, the other one being Mark Anthony, or Mark Antony. And he quickly deposes of both of them and says, I'm in charge now. And he rules autonomously as the emperor. And in his approach, Julius Caesar was extremely bombastic. He was not, he was unapologetic. He's like, I'm in charge now. I don't care what the Senate says. I don't care what the people say. I'm doing what I do. Because of this, the Senate turned against him and assassinated him. So if you've ever read like Julius Caesar by Shakespeare, you know, that's, I don't know if anyone's read that. Um, you read about that. If you ever heard that famous line, E2 Brutai, because Caesar gets stabbed in the back by his best friend, ice cold. <laughs> but anyway, Caesar gets assassinated. He's gone. So who's going to be emperor now? Well, Caesar, Julius Caesar, had set in place and put in motion someone to succeed him. And it would be his son, Octavian. We actually have a picture of him up here, dressing like a Jedi Knight. The force is strong with him. And Octavian comes into power. And if you check the history books, you probably won't see Octavian Caesar or Caesar Octavian anywhere. It's because the Senate actually changes his name. He becomes known as Caesar Augustus because Augustus means the august one or the respected one. 
And so he reigns as Caesar Augustus. And if you look at Luke chapter 2, which we're going to get into next week in your Bibles, who does it say rules the world? Julius Caesar, or Caesar Augustus. Not Julius Caesar. <laughs> Caesar Augustus. Hmm. So, a couple things you need to know about him. Four months after the death of Julius Caesar, he notices Octavian, or now Caesar Augustus, and other people in Rome, notice the star in the sky. This very curious looking star. It's a very bright star. It's got even like a little tail on it, and they don't really know what to make of it. So they, they believed that that was actually the soul of Julius Caesar ascending to the heavens to sit at the right hand of God the Father, Zeus, who was the top dog and the father in the Greek pantheon, and the Romans worshipped the Greek pantheon of gods. So they believed that this star in the sky was actually the soul of Julius Caesar rising up to sit at the right hand of the Father to rule as God. In fact, posthumously, the Roman Senate and the Roman people actually said that Julius Caesar was God, or he was sat at the right hand of God. Star in the sky, that should sound kind of interesting, familiar perhaps. Caesar Augustus decides to institute the celebration of this wondrous event, and he called it Advent. And they celebrated it for 12 days. If you've been in church for any time or have read the Bible at all, all this should sound really familiar to you. And at Advent, the Roman people celebrated the ascension of the soul of Julius Caesar to the right hand of God, and thus becoming a God himself. Question. If Caesar Augustus' father was God, what would that make Caesar Augustus? Son of God. And that's what people started calling him. And they believed that he was God incarnate. Later on in his reign and rule, the Roman Senate and the Roman people totally assented to this, called him the high priest and mediator. That's what Caesar was. He wasn't just the, the uh, military governor or the political governor, he was the religious governor of the empire. He was a religious emperor of the empire. And they called him the mediator between the people and the gods because they thought, oh, okay, well, his dad was, his dad's among the gods, and so he can mediate between the gods and the people. Mediator between gods and the people. Hmm. Son of God incarnate who is high priest and mediator. That should sound familiar if you've ever read your Bible. Curious. Now, the very beginning of Caesar Augustus' reign, he started this propaganda campaign. It was called Poetic Propaganda. He employed these various writers and poets to start writing things about him. And he, was, he would slip them, I mean, they were well paid too, so he'd slip them some money and say, hey, tell the people some things about me. Make sure it's really nice though, okay? Buy yourself something nice. And so he recruited all these various poets and all these various writers. One of them, if you've ever taken a history class, history of Western civilization or anything like that, you have probably heard of him. He recruited this guy named Virgil, who wrote this grand work called the Aeneid. And in this book, or in this this collection of poems, Virgil writes some pretty flattering things about Caesar. He says things like, Caesar Augustus is the divine king of salvation, who will bring about a universal reign of peace. And he will eventually bring about a renewed humanity. Huh. That too should sound kind of familiar. Hmm. Then, in response to this campaign, people started writing songs about Caesar. And we actually talked about this in our last series, Timeless. And these songs in Greek were called hymnos. And people would sing these songs to Caesar and celebrate his greatness. And in one of the songs, there was this very popular, very famous line that said that salvation is found in none save Caesar. Again, if you've read the Bible, that should sound eerily familiar to you. So as Caesar Augustus is trying to spread his popularity and grow his popularity, it starts to work. And the saying of the day became, Caesar is Lord. People said it throughout the empire. In fact, some historians say that became a greeting of sorts. Like, hey, how are you doing? Caesar is Lord. Hey, talk to you later. Caesar is Lord. It became the new hello. That's how pervasive he was in the society. And then, to make sure this message was communicated, he, and to make sure that everyone knew that he was ruler of the world, he decided to print his face on coins. We have a picture of it. Hopefully it's his good side. He printed all these coins 
Because in the Roman Empire, if you wanted to communicate a message, the best way to do that was to print it on a coin because it would spread throughout the empire. Think about how money works. So if you wanted to communicate a message, put it on the coin, and it will get all around the empire because they didn't have, you know, the internet and phones back then. And on some of the coins, let's switch to the next one. On some of the coins, it would just say things like, Caesar is Lord. And on some of the coins, one up there says it, it says, Augustus, divine. So the belief of the day was that Caesar was the son of God, God incarnate. It was to be worshipped as a god. And in fact, whenever Caesar Augustus would have any kind of a military victory or expand the empire in any any way, or if one of his generals would conquer a town, the people would erect an altar and a statue to Caesar, and they would gather around it, and they would celebrate the victory of Caesar and the greatness of Caesar. And these gatherings were called ecclesia, which in Greek means gathering, assembly, or called out ones. Interesting. We'll circle back to this later. So you had this man who's claiming to be the son of God, God incarnate. People are, are saying he's Lord, and people are meeting in these gatherings called ecclesia to celebrate his lordship. Hmm. Interesting. Last two things you need to know about Caesar Augustus. Now, this is historically attributed to in a couple of different places. Where I found it is in this work called The 38 Acts of Caesar Augustus. It says that in the time of Caesar Augustus, he issued a decree for a census of the whole world. Now, here's why. Here's what a lot of people don't know. Caesar Augustus looked around towards the end of his life, and he noticed that adultery was running rampant in his empire. And that people were living so uh, depraved and decadently that they were just not getting married and they weren't having kids. Well, as a Roman, this freaked him out because he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not producing any more Romans. We got to get on it. We got to make more Romans because we're expanding this huge empire. I'm not going to build a whole empire and have no Romans in it. We're going to get overrun and overpopulated by the people we're conquering. We got to get to it. We got to make more Romans. So this caused a lot of fear. And Caesar Augustus. So he wanted to know how many Romans were in his empire. Where my Romans at? So he issued this decree for a census of the entire known world. And if you look in Luke chapter 2, it says the very same thing. Maybe the Bible is actually historically accurate and not a collection of fairy tales. Just saying. Last thing you need to know about Caesar Augustus. He had a perpetual problem with succession. He, I believe there was about four different people at four different times that he appointed to be the heir to the position of emperor of Rome. All four died. Some of them at very young ages, too. So Caesar Augustus kind of has to compromise, and he ends up appointing his adopted son, Tiberius, to take over for him when he's going to die. Now, very interesting side note. There was a lot of beef between Tiberius and Julius, or sorry, and Caesar Augustus. And in fact, at one point, Tiberius kind of exiled himself to this island of Rhodes because he's like, "Ah, I'm tired of this, I'm not having this anymore. But he actually gets called out of retirement to come take over the empire. And very interesting here. At one point, Caesar Augustus forced Tiberius to marry this woman that Tiberius actually fell in love with. And he loved her dearly. But then when Caesar Augustus decided that Tiberius had to take over the empire, he's like, oh, 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 oh. You have to actually become my son. So you have, to marry my, you have to divorce your wife and you have to marry my daughter, Julia. And Julia had a horrible reputation in the empire for being a very open adulterer and a generally miserable person. So that caused some tension between them. We actually have a picture of this woman he was in love with. Boom. It looks like if Michael Jackson and Angelina Jolie had a baby, I think it looked like that. <laughs> and still, no eyeballs. I'm not sure what the, I don't know what the story is on that. But anyway. So this, Tiberius was forced to divorce the woman he loved and to marry Julia, Caesar Augustus' daughter. So Tiberius takes over. Um, Let's get a picture of Tiberius. Let me show you Tiberius. Whoa! How would you like to see that face behind you in line at the grocery store? Am I right? (laughs) Terrifying. Hold on. Oh, gosh. Okay. I'm not couponing. Don't worry. Terrifying, man. (laughs) That's shaped like a gumdrop, too. But that's Tiberius. Again, the bowl cut was very popular back then. So Tiberius comes to power. Now check this out. The beginning of the rule of Tiberius, the people said, the people of Rome said that this event was called the Epiphany. Which again, if you know anything about church tradition, sounds very familiar. And in Greek, and in Greek history and culture and writing, Epiphany 
was when a God, a divine being, made himself known to mere mortals. And that's what they believed Tiberius was doing. As Tiberius ascended to the throne of Rome, it was as if a divine being was appearing to mere mortals. And the logic behind it was this. Okay, well, Julius Caesar ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and so he was a God. And then, and then Caesar Augustus was a son of God, and he was divine. And so Tiberius falls right in line with that. So he too is divine. He is divine revelation. And they said that this epiphany of Tiberius Caesar, check this out, was cause and occasion for glad tidings of great joy. That should sound familiar, especially to the Christmas story. And as Tiberius, like Augustus, expanded the empire and enjoyed military success, news of these victories and success moved its way throughout the empire, and this news that would move from town to town to town to town to province to province was known as good news or gospel. That's just sound familiar too. Tiberius would go on to be called the good shepherd of Rome. Also familiar. And Rome believed that he, and they, they write about this and attest to this in many historical works, they believed that he would institute a new world order of peace. And they, and the Senate and the people gave him this term, prian soter, which means the divine salvation of humanity. Tiberius would be the salvation of all mankind, bringing about this universal reign of peace. Well, here's the thing about that, just kind of side note. Well, if you were Rome, if you were Roman, or you were all about the Roman Empire, yeah, there was peace. This was actually a, a period of peace, an extended period of peace in the Roman Empire called the Pax Romana. So yeah, it was peace for you. It wasn't peace for the whole rest of the world that you were slaughtering with slash and burn and shock and awe tactics. One-sided peace. So that's what people said about Tiberius. Now, two last things you need to know about Tiberius. One, he was horrible. Looking back, the people of Rome celebrated when he died. They said, to the Tiber with Tiberius, throw him in the river. We can't stand him. And all historians look back and point to Tiberius as a horrible Roman emperor. One thing you need to know, too. Last thing here. This is for your own Bible study and reading. Turn to Luke chapter 3. At the beginning of Luke chapter 3, who is Caesar? Tiberius. And Tiberius will be the Roman emperor for all the rest of the Gospels. So anything that happens in the life of Jesus outside of the birth is going to be under the rule and reign of Tiberius, this horrible, horrible Roman emperor who thought he was God incarnate, high priest. This will aid you in your Bible study because you have a new lens to read the Gospels through because you know who is claiming to be the divine king of salvation, the salvation of all humanity, this oppressive man named Caesar. So take that with you. That's a little side note. Just put that in your pocket for later when you're doing your Bible study. Now, last person I need to tell you about, this guy named King Herod. We have a picture of him up here. Finely manicured beard, luscious locks, and a Princess Leia haircut. It's terrible. So, you guys are rough looking. King Herod was not a Caesar. He was a king of Israel, and he actually deemed himself king of the Jews. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought Caesar ruled the world. Let me explain. Caesar would go from town to town, country to country, conquering, slashing, killing, destroying, and he would establish his reign and rule, but Caesar couldn't rule all the nations, so they would appoint a king that usually came from the people group they were conquering, and so that the people would feel like they have like an autonomous sense of independence and government. But these kings were just puppet kings. Oh, do what Caesar says. They, they, they weren't actually good kings. They were just controlled by Caesar. And that's exactly what King Herod did. Now, a couple things about King Herod. Again, this will impact how you read these initial chapters in Luke. Because King Herod is king over all of Israel. And especially, he does a lot of stuff in Jerusalem. Now, first thing you need to know about him, he was a tyrannical monster. He slaughtered anyone who opposed him. History attests to the fact that he even would round up the most influential Jewish men in the city and kill them just to make sure that no one ever rose up against him. What's more is he ended up killing several members of his own family, including his sons and one of his wives, because he had like a bajillion of them, because he thought they were trying to overthrow him. He was a psychopath. 
That's King Herod, and that's who was the king of the Jews at the time. And he oppressed the people terribly. Now, one interesting, one kind of good thing Herod did is he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. So if you, like, Google image search temple in the time of Jesus, you'll see that it's referred to as the Herodian temple. It's because King Herod came in, and, you know, he did, like, a house flip on it, and he refurbished the whole thing. And archaeologists to this day are baffled by it. The temple is made of these large stones made of marble called Herodian stones. And what, they, and what archaeologists find fascinating is that they can't find any archaeological evidence that they cut these stones on the temple mound. So what they're thinking is that Herod made these huge stones somewhere else and then shipped them into the temple. And they still, had to, to this day, have no idea how he did it because these stones go so deep down into the ground. And they cost a ton of money. So how is Herod getting all this money for all these projects? It's the last thing I have to tell you about him. Herod horribly oppressed the people, not only through violence and an oppressive regime and rule, but he oppressed them economically. So we've got to talk about taxes. In the Roman Empire, you would pay about 12% of your income to Caesar. Eh, that's not great, but I mean, it's 12%. 12% to Caesar. However, in the different places that Caesar conquered and established these puppet kings, there was a lot of exploitation going on. Kings would exploit the people, tax collectors would exploit the people, soldiers would exploit the people, and King Herod kept up this tradition. And we are told that King Herod, if you had grain, okay? So if you had your own grain, you raised grain. I don't know if you raise grain. Do you grow grain? I think, grow, I think you grow grain. Yeah, you don't raise it. You grow it. So if you grow grain... Herod felt entitled to 25 to 30 percent of the grain that you have. So if you worked hard and harvested all this grain, and you're like, "Yeah, all right, cool, my business is going to grow," uh, not so fast. Herod took 25 to 30 percent of that. Oh, plus your 12 percent to Caesar. Sorry about it. If you were a fisherman and you caught 10 fish, five would go to Herod because he would tax 50 percent of any fish that you caught. Now this is what people ate back then. So Herod instituted all these additional taxes. What's more, to pay for this expensive temple, there was a temple tax that you'd have to pay if you wanted to participate in the religious life of Israel. What's more is you had to pay a tithe, and even more than that, certain times a year, you had to pay a special offering or give a special offering to the temple. Historians now believed that the people of Israel living in this time of the early chapters of Luke were taxed, check this out, 80 to 90 percent of their income. I'm gonna let that sink in. 80 to 90 percent of their income. Yikes! And I tell you all this so that we, like my aim and my purpose in doing this, is to allow all of us to sit in the situation that the people of Israel sat in in the early chapters of Luke. These were an oppressed people who constantly had their expectations for this Messiah dashed. These covenant promises of God seemed like they weren't happening. All they knew was taxa heavy taxation, oppression. You can't say or do anything because you'll get killed. See, apparently Caesar is Lord. I mean, I thought our God was, but I'm told that Caesar is Lord, and if I, don't, you know, if I don't believe that, they'll kill me. This is what those people had to sit in daily. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we read it very much through our lenses. And we have a hard time understanding it, which is why it's profitable to do exercises like these so you can sit in the context and you can see through the eyes of the people of the day. These people were oppressed and they felt broken. And the only story they knew was the story of Rome. However, at this point in history when the whole world is united and all eyes are on Rome, and there are an affluence of historians writing down every detail that transpires in this time, God decides to break into this story and to tell a new story. And he's going to do that through the gospel writers and for the purposes of our series, through Luke especially. And God is going to tell this new story. And what's so brilliant about it is he's going to use the language, the imagery, and the story of Rome. And he's going to flip it on its head. He's going to turn it inside out. And he's going to provide a counter-narrative against Caesar because the people would understand language like this. Do you understand what I'm saying? The people living in this time, all they knew was Caesar and Rome. And so God, speaking through 
the author Luke, is going to use that language to communicate to these people. Oh, yeah, you think Caesar is Lord? No, 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 no. Let me tell you the real story, the good story. And so that's what we see here in Luke's story. So anytime you open up to the book of Luke or any of the Gospels, you should see a stark contrast between Rome's story and Luke's story. See, because in Rome's story, they celebrated the advent, the arrival of their king to the heavens of Caesar. And they believed Caesar ascended to the right hand of God the Father and ruled and reigned there. And in Rome's story, they celebrated Epiphany. They thought that Caesar was God incarnate, the son of God, who would mediate between the people and the gods. And in the story of Rome, they believed that a new Caesar was cause and occasion for glad tidings, and it was good news, and that, that Caesar was the good shepherd, and that he was the divine king that would bring about a universal reign of peace, and that he would bring about a renewed humanity. And in Rome's story, they believed that the path to peace was conquest and domination, and that victory came through violence. And that's all these people knew. But in Luke's story, and thereafter, throughout the rest of the New Testament, we are told a different story, a better story, the real story. And we celebrate the advent of Jesus Christ, not later ascending to, to the right hand of God, yeah, but actually coming down from the right hand of God. And we celebrate that advent, and we celebrate the epiphany of Jesus Christ, the divine appearance of God incarnate, the Son of God. It's actually a season in the life of the church, epiphany. It's coming up in like a month. And we believe that Christ's birth is cause and occasion of glad tidings of great joy. And we believe that that is good news. And we learn later in the book of Luke and thereafter that it is Jesus Christ who is actually the good shepherd. And that he is the divine king of salvation that will bring about a universal reign of peace and bring about an eventual renewed humanity or what Paul would later call new creation. And in Luke's story, it's not the path to peace is not about conquest and domination and victory doesn't come through violence. In Luke's story, the path to peace is following the way of Christ. And that victory comes through selfless love and sacrifice and grace and mercy. That's Luke's story. And in Rome's story, they believed with all their hearts that Caesar is Lord. And they would gather around these altars and these statues, and they would form these groups called ecclesia, gatherings and assemblies. And they would celebrate the victories of Caesar. And they would celebrate Caesar's goodness. And they believed that this empire and the whole world was inclined towards the powerful and the wealthy. But in Luke's story, hmm, they believed that Christ was king, and they believed that Jesus was Lord. And they would gather together in these assemblies these groups called ecclesia, which if you read the New Testament, that is the Greek word for church, ecclesia, the gathered ones, the called out ones. And they would actually celebrate the victories of Christ and the benefits thereof. And they would celebrate the goodness of God in sending his son, Christ, to rule and reign upon the earth and institute his kingdom of heaven. And this was an empire, this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of God, that was not inclined towards the powerful and towards the wealthy, but it is actually inclined towards the poor and powerless and mindful of the lost and the lonely. And in fact, to emphasize this, the first sermon that Luke gives us from Jesus speaks directly to this marginalized group of people, this poor and powerless. And we see it in Luke chapter 4. Jesus is in his hometown, Nazareth, and he stands up in the synagogue amongst all the religious rulers and all the people he probably grew up with, and he grabs this Torah scroll, unrolls it, and he starts to read from Isaiah 61, and this is poignant and powerful and very intentionally placed here. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me. Time out real quick. In Hebrew, the word anointed is Mashiach, which is where we get our word Messiah, which I told you about earlier in the sermon. And a lot of scholars and theologians think that this was Christ's initial claim of Messiahship. And he says, the Lord has anointed me, check it out, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free, and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. And this was Jesus' inaugural address for the kingdom of God that he was going to preach throughout his whole ministry. And if we keep in mind the audience of the day, the people living in the land of Israel, in these first couple of chapters of Luke, 
This was good news to them because they were an oppressed, marginalized, poverty-stricken people. And they thought that God had forgotten them. So maybe you're in a similar spot today. Financially, emotionally, health-wise, you feel like you're poor, poverty-stricken, you have lost a lot, and you may have, maybe you feel like God has forgotten about you. But this good news that the true king is proclaiming reassures us that God has seen us, and God has heard us, and God has not forgotten us. And as Christians today, we can take courage and confidence in the fact that we actually know the end of the story. Rome does not have, Rome, the empire, the violence, the greed, the system of oppression, does not have the final say. And Rome does not last. As a matter of fact, the only kingdom of this earth that has lasted and persisted is the kingdom of God that Jesus inaugurated in this sermon in Luke 4. It has continued past Rome. It continues today. And as a church, we are part of that. It will go on after us. And we're actually waiting still for the second advent, the return of Christ, to fully consummate that rule and reign of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And this is what the church has waited on for years and years and years and will continue to wait on until Christ returns again. But do you see the victory here? Rome doesn't win, which was great news for these people because they go on to learn, and the Christians that will come after them, they learn that actually Jesus wins. And so in the early church, they had this, what some people call a teaching Some people call it a theory. I call it a rallying point. And we never hear about it in churches today. I've literally never heard it discussed in a church. It's called the Christos Victor. Christos Victor is Latin for victory of Christ. And the early church celebrated this weekly, and they held this up. And in the Christos Victor, they believed that Jesus not only had victory over the empires and systems of oppression of their day, but they believed that he had victory over the personal sin in our lives that caused those systems, that snowball and get ahead of steam and, and turn into those systems. And even more than that, they believed that Jesus had victory over the powers of evil and darkness in the world and even hell itself. And the early church actually lived this out. And so they didn't fear Caesar and the empires and the systems of oppression because they said, oh, okay, do what you want. But Jesus has the victory. Christos victor, victory of Christ. And in fact, about two or three Caesars later from where we were today, Christians are persecuted. And they're like, that's fine, Christos victor, victory of Christ. You don't scare us. And the early church, they didn't fear their personal sin because they knew it had been taken care of on the cross and they had right standing with God and were filled with the Holy Spirit and they knew that through Christ they had victory over that sin that plagued them and that rebellion that seemed inherent. And they didn't fear it and they knew they had victory over it. And what's more, they didn't fear the evil powers of the day, they didn't fear the devil around every corner because they believed in the Christos victor, the victory of Christ. And maybe you never heard about this before, which I think is unfortunate because what would it look like if the church talked about the Christos Victor more? Perhaps we would not fear the empires of our day or the systems of oppression or the greed and anger and violence in the world because we would say, Christos Victor, victory of Christ, we're not afraid. We know which kingdom actually lasts. And maybe as a church and as individuals, We would not fear our personal sins and shortcomings or think, oh, I can't shake this thing or I I can't break this addiction or turn away from this pattern of living. Maybe we'd actually have confidence that through what Christ did on the cross, we we have right standing with God, we are filled with the Spirit, and that we can change and that Christ has the victory over that sin in our lives. So we don't need to fear it or feel defeated by it. And maybe we wouldn't fear the powers of evil and darkness in the world or see the devil under every rock or around every corner and being like, my car broke down, that devil got me again. We wouldn't worry about that because we're like, Christos Victor, victory of Christ. So today, Hope Church, that you realize that Jesus and not Caesar is Lord. And may we gather together as the ecclesia, the church, the gathering, the assembly, to celebrate the victories of not Caesar, but the victories of Christ.
and the goodness of Christ. And as an ecclesia, as this community of people, may we be a community that is inclined towards the poor and the powerless and mindful of the lost and the lonely. And especially at Christmas time, as an ecclesia, may we celebrate and remember the first advent of Christ, the coming of the true King. And may we eagerly await with preparation and peace for the second advent when Christ will return to bring God's right rule and reign on the earth once for all. And may we be more intentional and more excited and more empowered to celebrate the Christus victor, the victory of Christ. And may that embolden us to live for Christ in a new, refreshed, vibrant way. And in the meantime, may we proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to those who need it most. And may all of this be cause and occasion for glad tidings of great joy this Christmas season. Grace and peace to you, Hope Church. Let's stand and sing together.